All right, we're going to go over some of the uh, types of torque wrenches and precision measuring tools. Um, just try and get the camera set up here so that we can uh, see everything. All right, so I'll, um, obviously I'm going to move things in and out of the picture so you can see them. Um, the first one we're going to look at is a, a, a beam style torque wrench. I'm trying to get everything in focus here. Uh, a beam style torque wrench, right? And the way that this works is that by pulling on the handle, it, 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 it reads the torque. Um, uh, these are very uh, out of date and old, but they still work and they're very accurate. Um, one advantage on this dial is that when you look at it, we can can quickly or easily change from from right hand thread to left hand thread. It's just a, a looking at a how far this uh, beam actually flexes when we torque it, and hence the name of flex beam torque wrench. All right. There's one thing we should notice that on the end here, the handle pivots back and forth. And in order to make an accurate reading with this torque wrench, you must hold it so that that handle remains in the middle. All right, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to set it up so that this hinge point that it, it rotates on becomes the point where the center of your, your pull or your force is exerted and that is going to give you the, the correct amount of flex then on here. If, you, if we pull it where it's, it's leaning or, or prying at a different point then, uh, then you've changed the length of the, the working beam and it will change the reading. All right. The other thing for this one is to make sure that you are using one that is the appropriate scale for the one you want. Uh, this is a 3 8 drive with, uh, you know, that we're going to measure up to uh, 600 inch pounds. All right, remember that that's inch pounds, and this one is a uh, uh, foot pounds and up to 140 foot pounds. All right, now the inch pound torque wrench, when we make that conversion, there's one foot pound for every 12 inch pounds. All right, so if you wanted to know what this is, if this is uh, 600 inch pounds, uh, you would take that and divide it by 12, so 50 foot pounds. All right. Um, these are dial type torque wrenches. All right. Um, again, we have to, and you have to always uh, be very careful. They look very similar, but when you flip them over, right, first of all, the first clue is one is a quarter inch drive and the other is a three eighths drive. Now, these torque wrenches um, have, I'm going to say, very special uses, all right? They are designed more to, uh, they can read any torque as you are twisting it, but they have the, the thing that they're kind of designed, they're more along the line, that they're going to read the torque while it is rotating, all right? They wouldn't be that good to set the torque on... Uh, on a, a, say a cylinder head because in order to actually make that as you were torquing it you have to have your head directly over the top of it alright um, I don't know how that would work to show you in the vise alright okay move you around here a little bit alright alright you can see the red needle maybe moving on the on the the dial there, all right. So, I mean, it, it, it's kind of, it, and this is only, I'm only putting a small amount of pressure on it. And again, with this quarter inch drive, we are actually dealing with inch pounds of, of, of rotational force. And this one is foot pounds of rotational force. Now, uh, a, an application where we might use this torque wrench is setting up a power steering box or setting up a, a, a differential where what you want to measure is the, the rotational force as it's moving, all right? Uh, steering box is very light. It might be uh, under five inch pounds of rotational force when you're setting up the bearings on the shaft. Uh, differential, same thing. It may, you may set the, the, the input bearing and then be asked to measure the rotational force. All right, so that is a couple of applications where we would use this particular type of torque wrench. I'm just going to try and move things away here as we get them covered to 
to make it a little clearer. All right. Next we have, and these are, are, are very common in most of the shops. Uh, these are, are, are screw adjustable. All right. And we'll talk in a second about them. Just get you the other one out. All right. So again, obviously we have a couple of size differences, right? Length and 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 input. This is a three eighths versus the half inch. Um, the the main thing that we should understand with this is that when you are looking on here, we have a scale uh, which is going to read our our pounds of of torque, foot pounds of torque. Um, simply open it and twist it in order to get it up. Make your torque. You know, do whatever you need to do, but then. Uh, always return it back to zero all right they are very uh, specific they don't want them uh, to go past their lowest setting and they don't want to be left on the re the method that it uh, achieves the torque in here is a large spring and when you're screwing it, uh, it you're, you're basically um, stretching that spring out till you get a, uh, a um, the set torque if you leave it adjust it on over time that spring will become weaker and you will probably end up with a lower than actual torque when you're making your your torquing or your torquing of your cylinder head all right uh, same thing with the small one right uh, the only difference is the range um, these are both in foot pounds uh, get rid of these all right, um, so I'm going to turn the camera around here. Hopefully, we can see this. So now we're going into uh, something where you, you know, uh, for us in the, in the truck industry, we'll probably have a torque wrench that's more along the line of this size. Um, it, it, it's you know over 48 inches long. Um, one advantage on this style is that it has a small screw on it, which is adjustable to to turn you, uh, adjust your torque. With this particular style, once you make your setting and put it on, you can make your torque and uh, you, what will happen is you uh, uh, don't need to back this off all the time. Now it is probably a good habit to get into that when you are done, you always turn it back to the lowest setting and relock it and put it away. Uh, one thing I'm going to say about this torque wrench, right, and these are the, kind of the ones we would use all the time in the shop for adjusting uh, wheel nuts or ensuring that the wheels are torqued to the proper uh, amount. Um, same even with the half inch uh, drive one where we're going up to like 250 foot pounds. All right, any, any torque wrench that is used to install wheel nuts, it is mandatory that they be calibrated annually. All right, and that's often why the reason why you will see a lot of shops will have multiple torque wrenches because what they want to be able to do is send one torque wrench out to have it, you know, calibrated and wait till they get it back and then send the other one out to have it calibrated too. Um, but and I, I'm, by calibration, I mean by a company that is certified to uh, make that adjustment or make that check. That does not mean that the guy on the Snap-on or the Mack truck takes it out to his truck and brings it back in in five minutes and says, yeah, it's, it's dead on, all right? It has to be a sticker that's stuck on here with a date and by the company and with the, uh, the, the initials of the guy who inspected it to tell you that it is guaranteed that it is, is achieving the correct torque. All right. Now, where this is not used to set torque, uh, you may or may not be familiar with it. This is what is referred to as a torque multiplier. Uh, now, it has a little bit of, uh, of a different application. Uh, these are for tightening very, very uh, high torque bolts. And what you can do is use a half inch drive, set it in, and simply rotate it. What we have in here is a planetary gear which uh, roughly translates into four revolutions of, of the input to get one revolution of the output. Now I say roughly it is not exactly four. 
if it was an exact number or if you, you knew exactly what the, that calculation was, you could use a torque wrench as an input. And if you put 100 foot-pounds of torque into the input, you would get approximately 400 foot-pounds of torque on the output. Um, this requires, and again, you'll often see people slide a pipe over this to get the right length or to get a length that works for them. But this will simply turn around and, and stop on the ground or against the frame of a vehicle and then you can carry on and just uh, multiply your torque. With all the torque wrenches we've looked at so far, um, we're kind of looking at, at what has been in the past uh, very common. But you'll see that uh, a lot of the torque wrenches now, we're getting into a thing where um, they have built-in electronics. So uh, power on, all right, and I don't know if you can make that out, all right. Uh, so what you can do with this is you can set it up. This is set for 65 foot-pounds. But when we get to that torque, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and sell any one brand over the other, but they are, are designed to either buzz, beep, vibrate, uh, light up uh, or, or, and, and do all kinds of things. The other thing that this is capable of is actually doing a torque turn, uh, which I'll explain in a few minutes or up on the board. All right. So um, again, a little, a little more uh, advanced and a lot more money. Uh, make sure you turn them off before you put them away. Um, the thing with having that this o over or let's say perhaps over this one. It's been my experience that when you're using a half inch drive, and this one's up to 250 pounds, but when you are using it at very light torques, uh, this is a click type torque wrench and it is designed, I mean it gets its name so that when you uh, actually achieve the torque, it gives you a little bit of a, a little bit of a click in your hand and an audible click, all right, so you can actually hear it. But I have seen where a lot of times uh, people don't, uh, when it, because, because the, if a torque is very light, it, the, the, the sound of the noise that it makes or the, uh, the, the little jerk that it gives you in your hand when it makes that can be very slight. And people have, uh, have over torqued uh, bolts or components because they didn't feel that and they simply kept going, all right, and they went way beyond the, the limit of what the bolt should have been torqued at. All right, now I mentioned torque turn. All right, and this is actually another option and I'll show you the original one was this one. All right, and simply you would put your socket on here to on the bottom to attach to the bolt and you would put your, uh, your, your uh, half inch drive into here and you simply could would, would measure this how much it rotates around after you get to a certain torque all right um, that is a, a let's call us an analog model there's there's really nothing really to see uh, you can simply set the dial back to zero bef on every bolt and then if it calls for a 90 degree turn you simply turn it around till you get to 90 degrees all right and again, we've gotten a, a little more advanced in that this is a, a, uh, a capable of doing both torque and your, your, your degrees of rotation. All right, you can see where, we, where this one is good for up to between 5 and 100 foot-pounds of torque. And then you can uh, look at, at how many degrees of rotation you want to put on there as well. All right. All right. So those are all of those tools are, are having to do with, with torque and which we're going to go into when we're covering bolts uh, a little bit. But I just wanted to go over some uh, additional measuring things. Now uh, I have mentioned in class um, this particular uh, micrometer which is a ball micrometer and on the anvil end it has a spherical uh, point or, or tip as opposed to a flat one that would meet. All right, so that is one, uh, one style. Um, this one I've just grabbed and hopefully with the video we can kind of uh, see where this is. This is a imperial 
uh, vernier imperial micrometer and there is your your zero line and your scale and then as we rotate around you will see that those are my my vernier lines for coming up with a partial uh, number down to one ten thousandths of an inch all right uh, I've brought this out as well um, if you're looking for a, a, a set uh, you may you may find or you get a better deal when you're buying two or three in a set like this um, have a look though like I mean this is uh, these are actually metrics so 0 to 25 uh, 25 to 50 and uh, uh, sorry 50 to 75 so make sure you're buying a set that's going to be in the range that you're going to be working in all right these aren't going to be very good for a uh, a diesel mechanic to build engines because there's really nothing he's going to be fit now you may find that you're going to have to get uh, additional micrometers after to uh, work on specific stuff all right now um, all of those micrometers are designed to to uh, measure external right but this is is a depth micrometer and I just want to talk about this one very quickly um, this depth micrometer is set up so that as we rotate it right there is a lock here on the on the on the bottom all right but as we rotate it a pin comes out all right now there's nothing exceptional about that we could use that to measure the 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 depth of a uh, a, a hole or whatever a blind hole and simply set it in and then you screw it down until it touches. We use these all the time for measuring uh, counter bores on, on diesel trucks. The one thing I would say though is take, if, if we hopefully we can see it, um, because this is looking as it moves out this way, it actually starts from zero on the back end. So you have to understand that it's not so much what is seen, but what is hidden. So you have to maybe alter your calculations a little bit for that. All right. But again, a depth micrometer. Now, it this one, right? The w the way that it is set up, same as our other micrometers, will have a range of one inch. Or in the case of this one, because it's uh, yeah, it's it's one it's the one inch one. All right. Um, but what we can do is remove. The, the 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 chamber and replace it with a longer uh, rod and we can use it up to like three to four inch two to three inch one to two inch uh, and, and etc by just taking the end off and putting in a longer rod all right some other measuring stuff Um, everybody should real, uh, be able to see this is a very heavy very long uh, straight edge it is a, a not just a bar of steel but it is an actual machined uh, finish right so we would use this all the time and I didn't bring one over to, to check but I'm gonna I see that there is one right here so I'm gonna grab it This would be used to check cylinder head flatness, all right, or flatness of anything, but not just by itself. Should have got the stands, all right. Not just by itself. We use with that when we are checking a. And again, I know 99% uh, of you are going to refer to these as feeler gauges. I am going to call it a thickness gauge, all right. Um, what they are is a set of uh, varied sizes. Uh, usually they start from down very low, like one or two thou, um, and, and work their way up. So when you are using a thickness gauge, a uh, couple of things. Look for, if we were looking at the, the, the amount of limit on this, I would simply start with one of the, 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 the smaller sizes, holding my bar flat against the surface, I simply want to check and see whether the thickness gauge is going to go in through there. All right. Now, 
for this, and I'm going to turn this back up again. We have to do more than one measurement. All right. So along this, the, the cylinder head. All right. All right. So along the cylinder head, we are going to check. There we go again. Outside edge, middle, outside edge. Corner to corner, corner to corner. And depending on the head, we may also go across in three or four spots, right? Um, depending on the size of the head, right? This is a little four, uh, four cylinder or off of a v, uh, V8 block. So it's only approximately about uh, 15 inches long. The longer the head, the more of a, a, a deviation from being true that you may be allowed. You will have a very short de uh, uh, spec for, or a very small spec for measuring across the head because they don't want this to be uh, misshapen in any way or we're going to end up with a leak. Um, one other thing, anytime you are measuring this, all right, look at your specifications because your specifications are going to tell you essentially what you need to know. Uh, if this was allowed two to four thou over the length of the head, I would select the four thou uh, field thickness gauge and I would simply try it. If the four thou doesn't go in there, then I know it's, 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 it's less than that and it is in spec, so why would I bother uh, worrying any more about it? All right. Now, with the thickness gauges, there are uh, variations on this, all right? You can have the straight, very plain, short thickness gauge and you can use that a lot of times uh, with your uh, straight edge to uh, uh, determine whether the, uh, the surface is flat or not. These ones are bent on an angle, all right? They are not, ne not really designed to work with that thickness gauge. Um, these are more along the lines for, for doing an overhead set where you want to be able to get in, you know, in a very short uh, space, be able to get this in between a, a lifter and a rocker or a rocker and uh, an adjustment and, and be able to change it, right? Um, we do have another one, or I did have. All right, do, do, do. apparently they're gone missing overnight. Um, but they're very long. Uh, you would use them in an engine to basic uh, to look at uh, maybe piston to cylinder wall clearance over the entire length of the cylinder. So you simply put the long uh, thickness gauge in and you install a piston. You simply move the piston up and, and see whether you have drag over the entire length. All right, um, moving on couple of other things we want to look at. Oh yes, back to the micrometers. Um, this is again a micrometer, but this one is, is set up. It's much different. Um, this is for doing brake rotors. And what we end up is where the frame is much, uh, much longer uh, so that we can install this over the whole uh, surface of the rotor and not essentially just be measuring the outside. All right, uh, so uh, I know we talked about, about cylinder measurements uh, with the cylinder bore gauge. Um, another option would be snap gauges, All right? And I'm gonna cover the whole gambit here. Snap gauges are, are, are good in that they can be, give you a very quick measurement and I mentioned that when we were looking at the cylinder bore gauge. All right. Uh, select the size that is the, the, going to be your, your correct, right? And you can see in this, they go everywhere from, from this down to that. So that, that, is, that is quite a range. All right, hopefully you can see that and get everything in focus. I know I keep changing the camera. All right. Um, these are fairly cheap to, to purchase, so uh, they're not a big ticket item. Um, but along the same lines, except they are not uh, snap gauges, 
these are uh, small hole gauges, all right? And if you can see on that, on the end, it is uh, spherical, but it has a split down each side and with a tapered cone in the middle. And as I turn that in, what happens is the cone is spread out. So I can insert this into the bore of a, a, a blind hole and, and measure it by screwing it out till there's a slight drag, removing it, and then using a micrometer to actually take a measurement on it. And again, uh, everywhere, and this is approximately like about uh, half an inch, down to this size, which is a, uh, under an eighth. All right, same principle though. As you tighten it, it moves it out, and we can measure small holes. Now, another option when you get smaller than that and you need to find out the diameter of a hole, uh, a good practice or an option might be to just use a, uh, a, a set of good drill bits and simply use that as a, as a gauge whether it's, it's fitting or not and then convert it to a decimal equivalent. All right, uh, what else? A couple other specialty tools. Um, now, I, I obviously don't have the right size. This is a piston ring installer. And if you look on it, it it's uh, about an inch and a half uh, wide. This one is, is for a 4.320 diameter. Um, what you will have is a very thin edge and a slightly wider edge. What that's going to give you is over the, in this surface, as it's going down, the rings will be squeezed together. So you select the one that is correct for you and as you slide the piston down into it the ring is compressed and then goes right into the block. Um, these work good as long as you A have the right size, B keep this surface tight with the cylinder block uh, as it's going down. If, there's, if you get near the end and it actually does a little uh, uh, bounce up uh, you may end up where the, a ring will pop out between here and the block and you'll simply have to stir it over. Um, what else do we got? Um, pressure. Pressure gauges. And I'm going to roll this around and play with this. Okay. Um, so this is a pressure gauge and you'll often uh, hear me refer to this as a master gauge. All right, master gauge is a gauge that I own that I know is accurate. All right, anytime you have to make a pressure reading or, or question maybe a, a bad sensor, you can connect a master gauge to the system and then you, you know, you'll, you'll double check it. Um, think about this, if a, bad, if a sensor was bad on the electronic side of it uh, and it was sending a signal to the ECM to tell you that maybe oil pressure was low. All right. Well, you could you could rebuild the entire engine, uh, change the oil, change the filters, do bearings and everything else, and put it all back together and start it up again. But if you didn't change the bad sensor, you wouldn't. You, you know, you might have been doing all your work for nothing. So always confirm if you have a, a pressure reading uh, that that that's giving you an issue with a known master gauge. Now. This gauge has a liquid glycerin on the inside and the purpose of that, it's not an antifreeze or anything else, it is to keep the needle from bouncing up and down uh, on, on a, when you were taking your reading where it might be a bit of a pulsation in, in, the, in the pressure. Alright, now I'm going to turn the camera over to the board. All right. All right. So this here is a water manometer. All right. I'm going to bring it, lay it right out. All right. You can see that it is filled with a, 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 a green liquid. Well, the green is just a dye that we've added, so it's easy to see. But um, the way it is set up, and the, it's screwed up now because I've had it on an angle, and now the, the lock is turned on. All right. Alright, 
All right. So, turn it around so you can see. With the with the top open, these two valves. All right. Uh, and again, we, we can connect one. One can be connected to so, uh, something, but usually it's just open atmosphere. And I've put this black one on. All right. Uh, also open atmosphere. So what we have on this end is sorry on this end is um, air going in. All right. I'm going to lift this up. Lift this up. Lift this up. Lift this up. All right. You can see the fluids at two different level in there. And it's actually holding because my, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get everything in focus. This is obviously not going to work very good, so I'll probably end up doing it in class as well. Um, oh yeah, might as well not do that. Cut that out. All right, what else? Uh, A refractometer. All right, uh, these uh, this one is about 10, 15 years old. Uh, newer ones are much smaller. These are designed to look at uh, varying various things at for specific gravity. On the inside here, when you view through the hole in a bright light, whatever fluid you have put on here, uh, you will get a a reading on specific gravity. These can be used for engine coolant. Uh, either ethylene glycol or propylene glycol. They can be used for DEF fluid, um, windshield washer fluid, and battery acid. Um, what you have to do when you're looked through is simply uh, whatever fluid you're checking, make sure that you're using the right scale in there. You will see that there's multiple scales in here. Uh, so find that first and then, and then take your reading. Uh, it is operated by simply lifting it and putting a couple of drops of the, of the liquid on the glass, closing it away from your face, especially if you're working with any battery acid, and closing it and then just view through it. Uh, and it uh, uses the light and the, a prism to create a, a, a change in here. Um, Wherever the line crosses, right, and you'll see it, and when I say a line, I mean it's a, it's a shadow of, of sorts between a light and dark. That is where you take your reading from. All right. Uh, very at the end. Okay, here we go. So we're going to look at, we have, this is plastic gauge. All right. Now, plastic gauge is used to uh, check or measure clearance between um, maybe a shaft and a bearing, all right, in an engine. Um, one thing you should know is that for the three colors that I have here, red, blue, and green, that they are for different ranges, all right. Uh, green is from one to three thou. Red is from two to six thou. And blue is from four to nine thou. Now we don't use the blue very often. Um, most ca in most cases, the uh, crankshaft will be red, and the uh, piston connecting rod will be uh, uh, green. But you really just have to to look at your specs to to know which one to use. Now I'm going to uh, open a little piece of this just to show you what it is. Now this is the red, so it's a little bigger. Uh, when you feel a paper, you will feel almost like a, a thread on the inside. And it's called plastic gauge because it is kind of, a, it's almost, it's not that it's plaster seen, but it is malleable, all right? So here is, to give you an idea, that little red thread that I was talking about. Now, on the outside of that plastic gauge, you will see red and white in here as a scale. So the smaller the scale, the larger the diameter, right? And again, uh, this is six. So when we put this together and, and we take it off and we have it squeezed, it is essentially going to double its size and be that. Now, the white is actually a gauge as well. 
but if you can imagine if the bearing is at two thou, right, it would squeeze this red thread out to the widest red d dimension here. All right? Um, I'll leave that for the engine class as well. We can talk about this. So one thing I'm going to say with this, uh, when you are using plastic gauge, you put a small piece on, you don't have to wrap it all around. You put your bearings back together or your, your crankshaft uh, connecting rod or, uh, or uh, back together, your rod end, sorry, you're gonna have to take your, uh, when you put it in, you put your, your cap on, you torque it up to the full torque, and then you simply uh, loosen it, take the cap off, and observe it. Um, you cannot allow the shaft to rotate while you are taking your reading, or it will smear it out and you'll get a, 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 an, an erroneous reading. Um, the other thing, and the last thing, before you put the cap back on, you take your fingernail or a soft cloth, and you wipe all of the residue of that um, piece of plastic gauge off of the shaft. All right. Uh, if you leave it in there, it kind of acts like a windshield wiper, and every time it goes around, it's going to clean the oil off for you, which is not good for your engine. All right. And that is that. All right. We're going to use a dial gauge to show uh, a, a couple of methods of what we can do with the dial gauge and a set of V blocks in order for checking a camshaft. Now, the thing that we're going to we're set up here right now for is looking at run out. So I have the V box mounted up on the the journals near to the end of the shaft, all right, which is going to get show me the both uh, the most uh, deviation. And if the longer the, if it was longer, I would simply move them out to the end. All right, the dial gauge. Couple things always look for is what scale is it? This is a uh, one thou. Uh, reading. That means that every mark around here is equivalent to one thou. Um, this is a, a little spring-loaded uh, thing, right? And you can see, right? And give it a, a couple of, of, of jerks. I'm going to move it over to the center of this journal. Right? A couple of things when you're working with this, right? This is a solid shaft. If you do end up with uh, like a crankshaft or something where it would have a uh, hole cross drilled in it to allow oil to flow, um, make sure that your pointer is not set up uh, in line with an oil hole so that it drops in and then jams and, and, and screws up your adjustment. And you can see that this, we are hitting right on zero. And it is set at the, the, the second uh, rotation, so we've got lots of rotation. All right. Now you don't, you can move this around to get it at zero or or to take your reading, but it doesn't really matter when we're measuring out of round. If there is a, or sorry, or run out, if there is a uh, a bend in the shaft, it's probably going to deviate both ways from zero. So what you want to do from this point is you want to slowly turn it in one direction. All right, while observing the needle on the dial gauge. All right, this is actually in pretty good shape. I'm all the way around and I have less than one thou uh, run out. Now run out, when we look at this, is going to be if how much our shaft might be away from being true. So what I would do is I would look at what, as we turn this around and the needle hits on it, how far the needle goes in one direction and back to how far the needle goes in the other direction and that would be my amount of run out. Alright, now we can use this by shifting this over and putting it at the inner base circle of the cam lobe. And, as, and, and then again, zeroing it. All right, we can give it a little snap, make sure it's back at zero. And then I can simply just start turning this around, but I must count the revolutions. There's 100 uh, lines around there at uh, 1,000. So if I go around one revolution, 
that would be 100 thou. One, two, almost to the third. So that's 295 thou of cam lobe lift. All right. So we can we can write that down 295. All right. So another option would be. All right, come back here. Take this away. And just measure it with a micrometer. Measure it crossways across the inner base circle, right? Make your reading. And again, rock your micrometer a little bit to make sure that it's sitting flat. And make sure the ratchet is, is just clicking, that you're not too tight. Take your reading, all right? Then rotate it, open it up. And take your reading at the uh, at the top of the lobe to the inner base circle, and that would be your amount of lift. The other thing I would say that with a on this right, um, people often think that it's a good idea to use the dial indicator to look for out of round in the journal, but it doesn't actually work because you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between out of round and run run out on the shaft. So simply use a micrometer. Turn it in on the journal till it's it, it's fitting snug. All right. Then rotate the micrometer 90 degrees, and it should fit with the same amount of drag on it. Now I'm going to give you a little shortcut. All right. I've just made this 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 uh, measurement. I can lock it. Right. But, so not only should this be the same measurement at 90 degrees to be out of, uh, to, to check for out of round, but every journal should be the same measurement. And I can feel the drag on this one the same as it was on the middle one. And this journal. Alright, and I can move it down and I could do this journal. Alright, and I could do this one at, at two angles. Alright. So, what I've done is how I've checked one, two, three, four journals at two different angles, and they're all very close or, or the same. Now I can take my reading, and I, I'm done. I've made eight measurements with, with using with this. On a crankshaft journal or a... a, a a camshaft journal, any of those, those journals should all be the same, exact same diameter because if we had one that was bigger or smaller it would change how much it flexes and it would probably break.